Hi, Steve Van Meter, and welcome to your Wednesday night premiere. We take 15 minutes every Monday and Wednesday night to try to make sense of markets that people want to bid higher despite weakening global economic data. Now, if that makes a lot of sense to you, it certainly doesn't to me, but it does remind me a lot of the housing market bubble and the dot-com bubble where people just can't get enough, where there's this absolute belief that prices must go higher. The only question is when the day of reckoning comes, when investors realize the economy cannot support higher asset prices, what's going to happen? Because unlike markets past, there are fewer publicly traded companies now than there have been, which means there's more people crammed into a smaller number of stocks with their entire life savings. It will be interesting. Now, what could that day of reckoning be? Well, it might come a little sooner than we think. After all, uh, we're still waiting on President Trump to sign the Hong Kong bill, which we know China has made it very clear there will be retaliations from of what they will be. We don't know. And at the moment, it appears that he's going, it looks like, we, we don't know that there could be a pocket veto. And yes, I know I'm sick and tired of talking about the trade war, but how many days can people buy stocks based on the fact that the trade war is bullish for the economy. They've been doing this for 22 months. I thought it was 18. I was wrong. I've been off by four months, 22 months. People chasing stock prices higher as the global economic data declines. It's crazy. It does tell you though, when, the, uh, when this does get unwound, there will be some nice buying opportunities as all these people get flushed out. But what is what is a canary in the coal mine? Well, it could be that whether or not President Trump signs the bill or vetoes it, but if he pocket vetoes it and it goes back to the House and Senate where we'll have to assume it's passed because there was only one person that voted against it between the two, the China, let's say they pull out of the trade war and say, hey, you know what? We're not happy with that. So this deal's off. Where are investors going to go? running for the hills is probably what they're going to do. The content of this video is provides educational information only is not intended to provide investment or other advice materials not to be construed as a recommendation or solicitation by a security finance product is for an order to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was prepared by Steve Van Meter more personal capacity. The opinions expressed in the video that I'm going to do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advisors Inc. or Steve Van Meter Financial. Let's just go right to the economic data to tell you that things globally are not recovering. A lot of one of the big beliefs of most investors is that this is just a mid-cycle correction and that the economy is going to boom much like it did after 1995 because that's what fed chair powell has said is coming because he is the new maestro like alan greenspan well chinese industrial profits posted last night contracted 9.9 percent on a year over year basis so that means they're down 9.9 percent from october of 2018, their profits. Now, if we look, click on this, you will readily see, and uh, well, maybe uh, we won't readily see, but this, when I was looking at this uh, the other day, it was um, much more detailed, but apparently today uh, it is, they've not. But this is terrible because historically, this time of the year, Chinese industrial profits are rising. Why is that? Because what are people like you and I doing in American consumers? We're buying for the holidays. Let's take a look at today's economic data. Just to give you an idea that things are not as rosy as everyone thinks, we see mortgage applications were only up 1.5% last week, and that is not showing signs of strength. Remember, people were bidding up interest rates, believing inflation and demand is coming. This is not demand. I mean, you can look at the longer term trend. Hey, they have something. It worked. Uh, and you can, I kind of like the line bar, but you could see. It's not big. There's not big numbers going on here. We can even go and look at the uh, mortgage market index, the overall index. And you say, oh, wow, well, look, it's way up there. Okay. Yeah, it's way up there. It's kind of at its peak, roughly its peak of the cycle, well below where it has been in prior cycles. So the housing market isn't that strong compared to what we've seen in prior cycles. But people were kind of excited today uh, because durable goods new orders were up 0.6%. But September's were revised down minus 1.4%. It was positive, 
in September, revised negative. Now, I don't buy that this uh, point 0.6% increase is gonna hold, mainly because the, the factory survey data doesn't tell us that things are that good. And we can go over here and look at manufacturers' new orders durable goods on a year-over-year -year basis and look at five-year treasury yields also on a year-over-year -year basis. And you can see treasury yields, when they contract, they lead to lower durable goods. And you can see we get this kind of seesaw motion here. It's not like a straight line down. And you can see going into the dot, uh, you know, the dot com bubble collapse that it was a seesaw way down. And you can kind of see it, even in the mortgage bubble, it bounced up and then fell. So treasury yields are telling us that financial conditions are very, very tight. And any moves higher in durable goods probably are unlikely to last. And you can see when treasury yields get this far down on a year over year basis, it literally drags new orders lower with it. And new orders could continue falling even after treasury yields on a year over year basis rise. How about when we compare that to crude oil, uh, which people are very, very bullish on. Uh, I don't know why, if we have time, I'll look at the charts and show you. But here you can see, why would a company, a manufacturer need crude oil if there are weaker demand for new orders. Well, they're going to already notice that and they're going to put in orders for less oil and hence why we've been seeing crude oil builds. And you can see blue crude oil is declining even though there's heavy speculative interest which we've looked at on, on Mondays and we will look at this coming Monday. And you can see durable good new orders tend to generally follow the price of oil. And when new orders are falling and oil prices are rising, well, oil prices will adjust lower. So all the people that believe the oil prices are gonna spike like they did in 2008. Well, it's not that likely given the direction of durable goods new orders. Anyways, let's go back to the data and continue to look. Personal consumption expenditures on a year-over-year -year basis went lower, meaning consumers, according to the Fed's gauge, are consuming less. That is not inflationary. That is not bullish. I'm not gonna pick on pending home sales because new and existing home sales were up, pending home sales were down. Uh, pending home sales tend to lead, but they, they all can be very, very noisy. But here's something that tells you a lot. Personal income, flat for October. Personal spending is up for October 0.3%. What did we see in the sentiment data, the consumer confidence data the other day? We saw present situation, meaning how I feel right now, con consumers were feeling less confident. Well, there you go. They know their incomes aren't growing. Yet they were optimistic, which means I'll spend anyways because things will get better. And on an inflation adjusted basis, which when you see real, that's inflation adjusted, personal consumption is only 0.1%. So nothing bullish there, but look at crude oil inventories. Market thought they were gonna be negative. They were positive. How about gasoline? You know, you wanna talk about demand and what's going on in the underlying economy outside of the stock market. Oil companies raise gas prices and reduce gas production. And so the forecast was there's gonna be a slight build last week. There was a 5 million barrel build. This huge, huge in the gas world. Let's see if we can uh, get a chart of that. And you can see it's spiking. It's pretty high. This is not normal. But market considers this very bullish. But I wanted you to see some of the data because What's going on in the markets is not being reflected in the real world. The NASDAQ McClellan summation index, a proxy for liquidity is rolling over despite stock prices fighting to push to uh, new highs. And last but not least, and maybe the topic of this video is the Fed's magic is not working. So, so many people really believe that the Fed has this magical ability to raise asset prices. And as I've said, and if you really think about it, if a central bank could do that, why wouldn't they do it? Why wouldn't they say, hey, you know what? We'll just make sure everybody's prosperous. Buy houses, buy stocks. We'll make sure they go up more than they go down. Why wouldn't they just do it all the time? Makes sense? So what people are looking at is the Fed's ability to do this and they see the Fed easing and they see a repeat from the great financial crisis. Now let's go look and I wanna come back and I'll explain what's going on. So you see here's quantitative easing one. See how the monetary base 
took off. And what is a monetary base? A sum of currency, including coin and circulation outside the Federal Reserve Banks and the U.S. Treasury, plus deposits held by depository institutions at Federal Reserve Banks. Or that second part can be translated to bank reserves. Wow, something big just fell outside and made a lot of noise. Um, anyways, <laughs> this is quantitative easing two and quantitative easing three. You can see I'm not overly concerned because I'm not running out there to check it. Okay, so let's do a survey of what's going on with the Fed. There has been three rate cuts. The rate cuts are worth about 60 billion each, so that's 180 billion. And that started that August 1st. Then they've done two $60 billion asset purchases, which will conclude on Friday if they haven't already concluded for the month. So now you have 180 plus 120, 300 billion. And their overnight and term dollar loans, which were meant to be temporary to patch the ship, are now pushing $300 billion. So we have $600 billion in easing. What, four months? Yeah, August, September, October, no, four months. The men mind you, this is temporary and it's not quantitative easing. And it's only because of tax problems that start of September 15th that have never disappeared. It's because the Fed over tightened. But anyways, I meant to look at this last week and show you, but let's go and look at the monetary base because what we want to see is this, these big jumps in the monetary base. Okay. All right. So here is July 30th. So August 1st, they don't have a print on, but it will work close enough. $3.3 trillion. Now, $600 billion worth of easing later. $3.307. Not there. It's not there. There should be, at zero seven should be like a five or six or four. Should be something. So we got $600 billion of liquidity injection, $7 billion is there. And that is because there is a massive, massive dollar shortage from the Fed over tightening. Now let's take this chart and look at it from the perspective of world dollar liquidity, which you do by going in here and looking at the um, year over year rate of change. Now we don't have all of the data for the foreign held securities to put into this, but we can see that world dollar liquidity is still in contraction. This is our closest proxy we had with. So dollars are still being destroyed. So there still is a demand for dollars. And you may not have heard, but China is thinking about issuing or borrowing money to get dollars. They're, think, they're talking about issuing a bond in Yuan to get dollars. You said, wait, they can do that? Yeah, sure they can. Why? I mean, look, if somebody can borrow to get dollars to build a bridge, why can't you know they borrow to get dollars because maybe somebody wants you one. Probably not many people, but they still, that's how bad the dollar liquidity problem is. It's not showing up in the US stock market, but showing all over the rest of the world in the economic data. Let's take a quick scan of some charts. We'll do more of this on Friday. Yes, I will uh, be here to do this um, because obviously I do want to see the economic data and I want to share it with you. 30 year treasury yields. Looked like they were going to move down, close the gap from last night or the night before, and then made a new gap and then closed it. But you see here it bounced off of what is now resistance, what was support. Now, why is this important is because when you get a flip between support and resistance, so across the support, it now becomes resistance. Something about coming through the ceiling and now you're checking, you're checking to see if the ceiling's still there. Why is that important? Because the market's saying, hey, are there any sellers out there? Here's a chance. Here's a chance. And guess what? There weren't very many today. So interest rates fell. Obviously, the economic data supported that. And that still does point to a retest of their all-time lows because this was the major level of support going back to 2016. The dotted line was the former 2016 all-time highs. So this does suggest that we will see a run down here and all those quantitative computer models and algorithms are sold, not bought back. Now, let me just show you real quick what the oil market thought today. Here you can see crude oil builds, gas builds. Oh no, oh no, market. Yeah, forget that. It's okay. Everything's going to be fine. So it just goes to show that investors are playing chase. 
and all they care about is playing chase. They're not looking at the underlying data and when it blows apart, they're gonna find out the exit door is a lot smaller than they think. That will be a buying opportunity. The other thing is when we look at the monetary base, it's why gold is not, a lot of people are really bullish on gold. Long-term I am, short-term I'm not. Because the monetary base is the key. And if monetary base isn't rising, gold that needs to pull back down, the Fed needs to panic. There needs to be some panic event. And when you're running 300 billion of dollar liquidity loans, the Fed's secretly panicking and they don't know what to do. I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving and I'll be back Friday with our weekly economic update. I'm Steve Van Meter. Bye now.